Good afternoon and welcome to this session where we are going to be discussing uh, electric vehicles. Uh, the promising solution to decarbonize uh, the, this big part of the mobility system, which is automobiles, and how to do this with an ecosystem uh, mindset approach. Um, if we wanted to replace uh, the global vehicle fleet from combustion en engine to electric vehicles, uh, we would need 3 billion tons of lithium. This means 700 years to extract this lithium. This is the kind of challenge. So this is not an easy challenge. And it can only be done if we do this with a mentality of value chain, which is what we will propose to you uh, this afternoon. Uh, how to uh, tackle uh, the emission reduction across the value chain from batteries to charging stations, energy grids, and the critical materials needed uh, to manufacture them. How to mobilize policies, regulations, incentives on circularity, on recycling, on uh, materials extraction. Uh, what kind of partnerships uh, will be needed? What kind of public-private collaborations uh, can foster this transformation. This is what we will be discussing today in a session that is informed by the work uh, of the Circular Cars Initiative, which is part of the World Economics Forum Center for Advanced Manufacturing and Supply Chain. And we're going to do this with a stellar panel. Let me briefly introduce them. Um, to my left, um, Brian Kemp, governor of the state of Georgia. Welcome. Uh, to his left, Hilde Marete Asheim, uh, CEO of Hydro Norway leading aluminum uh, company uh, provider of materials, therefore. To her left, Robin Zheng, founder and CEO of CATL China, one of the largest battery manufacturers in the world. And to his left, last but not least, Jim Rowan, CEO of Volvo Cars um, and also chair of the uh, Alliance of CEO Climate Leaders. So uh, with this, let me <clears throat> start uh, this conversation with uh, Jim, I'm going to start with you. You are a leading electric vehicle manufacturer. Uh, what is it that keeps you up at night? What are the main challenges that you have top of your list? How long, how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> We've got to be done in 45 minutes, and everyone has to speak, including the audience. I will try, I will try to be brief. So, first of all, you need to start with the technology. I'm an engineer, and so I look at it from the point of, of physics and engineering. And when we, when we look at electrical propulsion, it's clearly a better engineering solution to what we have right now. We had steam, that was good for a while. We moved to petrol, and now we're moving full scale towards electric vehicles. There's less noise. So if you look at a really good uh, internal combustion engine, roughly it's 35% efficient in terms of the energy put into the movement that you get in the wheels. If you take a really good propulsion system, the, the latest system from Volvo, for example, 93% efficient. You don't need to be a data scientist to figure out that that's a big data point. So there's less noise, there's less heat, there's less vibration, and there's zero tailpipe emissions. So let's assume that it's the right technology. Now, what keeps me up at night is actually the same thing that gets me out of bed in the morning. And that is that we have a massive opportunity ahead of us. We have the technology, but we also have a massive challenge. It's clear, to me at least, that we have a global climate crisis on our doorstep. It's clear that we need to act now. It's clear that the sheer scale and the complexity of the change, as you, as you mentioned, will require academia, it will require government, it will require financing, and it will require industry to work together. There's, there's no way that we can do all of this on our own. What's not clear to me is if we have the fortitude, if we have the collective will, and if we are prepared to make choices that may affect the short-term results of our companies for the long-term benefit of society. That, for me, is still not clear. And not only are we out of time, it's my belief that we are out of excuses. And I don't think that history will look towards us favorably if we don't act. So we have, three, <coughs> we have three areas where I think we need to look at. We need to look at self, we need to look at suppliers, and we need to look at society. If I start with self, what are we doing as Volvo cars? So first of all, we have, we have stopped diesel. We have stopped all our investment in internal combustion engines. We have committed to be a 100% electric company by 2030 and be 50% electric by 2025. We've committed to be net zero by 2040. And we've committed that we will be 
a full scope three reduction of 40 percent scope one two and three of 40 percent by 2025 and 75 percent by 2030. We've also increased the targets on water, water usage, and set ourselves targets to get a higher biodiversity score. That's the next thing on the agenda, it will be biodiversity. And we've moved to full 100% uh, green debt. All of our factories around the world, all of our manufacturing factories around the world are already at 75% climate neutral, and will be at 100% climate neutral in all of our factories by 2030. But that self, 98%, like most companies, 98% of our greenhouse emissions come from scope three. So while we can look at ourselves and be and congratulate ourselves on good results so far, unless we attack the supply piece, it really doesn't matter too much. And in that sense, then, we really need to make sure that we work with our suppliers. This is not about beating up suppliers and asking them for cost reductions, it's about working together. And finally, bringing in legislation from government. That's the society part. Mm -hmm. Because we need green energy. All of this revolves around green energy. It's as simple as that. We won't get green steel. We won't get green aluminium. We won't <coughs> get green energy to recharge our electric cars unless governments step up, and I mean really step up, and put the investments into green infrastructure, especially around, around green energy. And all of these things need to happen in parallel. We need to do the self, of course. We need to make sure we work with suppliers and we need to make sure that we work with governments and other legislators around the world to allow us to have the chance to get to where we need to be. And finally, I guess I would just say, at the same time, and I know there is a lot going on, but we also have to, need to lift our eyes towards the next specter, which is gonna be not just CO2 emissions, but biodiversity degradation and how we look to the oceans and other uh, areas of the world, which is much more dependent on how we behave as companies towards biodiversity. That's what keeps me up at night. Wow. Uh, so essentially what I take from this um, first intervention is this idea that we have to organize this transition. And we have to look at the short, the medium, and the long um, with... Um, an idea that this is about a value chain, not just about you are at the end of the chain, in, in a way. Let me turn to one of your suppliers, which is uh, Robin. Uh, in a way, you are the piece that needs uh, to work uh, for the car to uh, uh, be driven. So what is it that, what's top of your list? Uh, let's say not when you go to bed, but when you get up. What's your main preoccupation? <laughs> when I get up, it's uh, looking for breakfast. <laughs> 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 so, Jim, thank you so much for you know give us some uh, business on this uh, e-mobility. Mm -hmm. For C8, uh, uh, we definitely I think everything rely on in, in uh, innovations. We definitely need to look for the technology innovation to solve, I think, uh, major problems. For example, uh, we're talking about lithium shortage, so that's why we are develop a lot on the sodium batteries, which is uh, uh, definitely is not as good as the lithium battery, but. Uh, it can be an affordable car. You can have uh, 400 kilometers, uh, 500 kilometers with this uh, uh, sodium battery, which another, another size we call a business model change. So consumers is, have not necessarily to own the whole car on batteries. They can own the car without battery. Mm -hmm. Then the battery is a leasing, okay? Let me give an example. In China, some of the car makers already can make the car as, as low cost as uh, 10,000 euro uh, electrical car without battery. Then you're leasing a small battery, for example, 200 kilometers range in your daily community. And in the weekend, when you want to go, go somewhere, so you have leasing another bigger pack, which can have uh, enable you 600 kilometers range. Then after two days, you can return back this battery to the stations. Then you rental back to the 200 kilometers battery, which you really can save a lot. So such kind of things, that's too critical. One is uh, you need people to build the SWAT stations. Second, you need people to own the battery asset as a leasing. So when the interest rate goes down, all these two is easier to be managed. Mm -hmm. So I think we've, and another thing is recycle, you know. 
lithium recycle, nickel recycle, cobalt recycle, magnesium recycle, all that can do the recycle things together. So I do agree with Jim about this. Uh, we need to work together everywhere, not only the, the, the industry, right? We need a, we need a government, we need a, all the, the even consumers to think about how to make this uh, decarbonize as, uh, as, uh, as early as possible. Yeah, thank you for this uh, view on innovation, which is uh, uh, extraordinary in, in this uh, automobile sector. Um, how do you, I mean, critical raw materials for you is essential. Uh, how do you ensure, how can we improve the resilience of access to the kind of critical raw materials that you will need for the manufacturing of the batteries? Yeah, we put the several segments of the car. For example, for the uh, premier car, like a Volvo, right? They usually need a very high energy density of the batteries, which we, they need a nickel, cobalt, magnet somewhere. But the affordable car, lithium ion fastway is good enough. That's number one. Number two is uh, we're still talking about technology is because <clears throat> most important is uh, the 100 kilometer range, what kind of energy consumption you need it. For example, energy efficiency. So some of the people as good as uh, 12 kilowatt hour, then you already can drive your 100 kilometers. Some people need uh, 15 or 16 kilowatt hour. Compare this, it's already 25% difference. That's one thing. But the people, when you buy a car, usually you want to have a 600 or 700 kilometers range for you comfortable. In that case, you need a seven times 12 is 84. Seven times 16 is 104, or two. In the limit space, 102 battery pack, you need a higher energy density, which you need nickel cobalt is involved. Then it's a, you have double hit. Number one, you have more 25 or 30% of the battery pack needed for 700. Number two, because the limit space, you can only use NCM, nickel cobalt magnetic system to make a battery, which is another price high. That's why 25%, 1.25 times 1.25, you get a huge cost increase and also energy problem, uh, and also the resource problem. That's the whole thing that I want to ask OEM to try to how to make sure energy consumption efficiency mm -hmm. is very important for future. Thank you. Um, let me uh, turn to you, uh, Hilde. You are the supplier of the supplier. Um, yeah. So in a way, we're going down further down in the value yeah. chain. What's your, so how do you look at this? I mean, what's your main concern when looking at the contribution you will make to decarbonizing this value chain? I thought you should ask me what, what keeps me up at night. That is, <laughs> that's a, a very long way of saying <laughs> what keeps you up at night. <laughs> What really keeps me, uh, what I'm concerned about is, um, uh, is the planet uh, that we live in, which is on fire. And we see extreme weather conditions, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, there is a call for action. I'm concerned about my granddaughter living in, in, on this planet if we don't uh, react, uh, and we have to react now. And, um, and uh, the, electrical, the electrification of the transport sector is, uh, is, is one way or one, one enabler. But um, to, to go from fossil fuel car to an electrical vehicle is only half the way. Because uh, an electrical vehicle needs steel, it needs aluminium, it needs uh, a lot of material. And just steel and aluminium stands for 25% of the global CO2 emission in the world. So, uh, so if we don't do anything, that is not sustainable. Uh, we, when we're now going to change the whole, uh, the whole fleet of, 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 of vehicles. And, and, and that's where my company come in. Um, Hydro is uh, today an aluminium and energy company. We are one of the few companies in the world which, uh, which has the whole value chain um, in aluminium under one roof, under our roof, from bauxite, where we mine in Brazil. We, are, we are, have the world's largest refinery of alumina. We have smelters, uh, which are based on, uh, on renewable energy. And we have the largest extrusion system in the world. Uh, we have um, a global business, 32,000 employees around the world. And, and what, 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 what I'm excited about is uh, that um, partnership is the new leadership. 
And uh, when we see now how we, how we co cooperate now in the first mover coalition, for example, and, and, and Jim, you mentioned the scope three, when, uh, when we see that um, automakers are setting their scope three targets, they are looking for partners which can produce uh, low carbon aluminum. And that's where my company comes in because we, we produce primary aluminum based on renewable energy, which has a footprint of 85% lower than the industry average. But what is the fastest way to low carbon is through recycling. And, and that is so fantastic with aluminum, is that it can, it, it can be recycled and recycled without losing its properties. It's more or less urban mining, because in that window that sits there, if, if, if it's produced in aluminum, you have the bauxite, you have the energy, you only need 5% energy to recycle it. And uh, that is where we want to position ourselves to uh, meet uh, the, uh, the, the advanced and, 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 the, and more and more customers are uh, looking at their footprint. And, uh, and that, that's, that's where we want to, part, to partner. And, uh, and we are not satisfied where we are today. We have a target to get to zero. And uh, like Jim was saying, what, what you, you are doing, we are chasing the CO2 um, from the bauxite all the way to the finished products. We, have, we, we are in the middle of the energy shift uh, in, in Brazil from fuel oil and coal to, to gas and uh, electricity. We are uh, with our best top uh, technologists. We're trying to get the carbon out of the electrolysis process. That's the technology that we have had for 130 years. And we have to get, we have to get that carbon out. And then we are exploring hydrogen, plasma, and also bio, uh, biofuel uh, to, uh, to take the, the gas out of the gas houses. So, uh, so we will do our part, uh, and, but it is really exciting when we can team up with companies where we can work together, uh, particularly on the recycling, because, because and, and, and what is exciting now is that the dialogue with the, with the <coughs> most advanced customers happened at the CEO level, so, because it's, mm. it's not the procurement and salespeople that talk. We're talking at, I talk with Ura Kalenius, which is the CEO of Mercedes, I talk with Martin Lundstedt, which is the head of Volvo, Volvo Group, uh, and they set, we set the tone uh, in terms of sharing the same prospects of the world and, 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 and sharing the same values. And I agree with also what you said, Jim, that it's not only about CO2, it's about biodiversity. When we do mining, we have to, uh, we have to as quickly as we take the bauxite out, we have to, to rehabilitate. And, uh, and, and, and we study the bio tool before we take the forest out to get to the bauxite. And we, and, we, and we put these seeds in plantation. And two years after, we put the seed in the ground to bring, to bring the forest back. So, so because it's about climate, it's about uh, nature, and it's about being a good force in the local communities. Having the acceptance of what we're doing is also extremely important. Thank you very much. Uh, so two big... Uh uh, threats in what you said, uh, global business, and this idea that th this is a global level playing field that we're looking for. And the second, the idea of uh, this circular economy that is to be exploited that can also contribute uh, to the objective. Third, you ended on leadership. So it's a good segue uh, <laughs> uh, to the leader of a state, uh, Georgia, governor. Um, you, in a way, are... Um, basically interested in making sure that uh, any of them, uh, if possible, the three of them, end up uh, manufacturing in your state. Um, more broadly, you need to organize uh, this transition on the ground. You are uh, very much on the policy, regulation, taxes, uh, on the incentives, and planning uh, for the transition. Uh, what keeps you up at night? Well, I think being in a little different situation than an OEM or, or one of the suppliers, you know, we are trying to support in Georgia. We have an incredible business environment, incredible infrastructure, ports, rail, airports, you know, just great places for, for companies to be to produce uh, really anything in our state. But my goal is for Georgia to be the e-mobility capital of the world. Um, we're well on our way to doing that. We have some uh, great OEMs there with the Hyundai Meta plant, uh, the Rivian plant. Kia's adding uh, an EV line to go with their existing line that's been in Georgia for, for 20 years. So 
we made a lot of promises to these companies, telling them we can supply the workforce. Uh, we, we had great sites and all these other things I mentioned, but really what keeps me up is, is being able to supply the workforce to do all of the different things that, that these companies uh, want to do. We're not trying to tell the companies what to do. We're trying to let them know that we have hardworking people uh, we, we believe in a lot of the things that they're doing is providing good paying jobs to our citizens and we want to support uh, their corporate goals. And so to me, that's the big thing for us is making sure we have the workforce. Um, we've gotten, you know, just with since Rivian and Hyundai, we've got 40 supplier projects. We've got battery pro uh, projects in the state. Uh, we've got an air mobility project. And so we're trying to support those folks, but we're also being forward thinking of, you know, how do we keep this circle going? So we've been very aggressive uh, going after uh, recyclers to be part of that, that system to make sure that we're not having a dependency on one place in the world for uh, rare earth minerals and other things, but to really, I think, diversify the supply chain. Uh, but it, it really is what is driving our suppliers and that's why they chose Georgia because they know that they can come uh, and really have a good business environment in our state find a good workforce and that they'll have a state government that supports them in that thank you very much and thank you also for focusing on skilled labor that at the end of the day is what uh, needs to make all of this work uh, I guess a common theme in all of you uh, is this idea of partnerships and collaborations right so let me uh, Jim go back to you how do you what do you look for in a partnership how do you see the partnership well for us we need to first of all we need to figure out we spend a lot of time on this from a strategy point of view what do we what do we build that we see as a core competence that we want to retain and develop with inside, within Volvo? And what do we buy? So he's looking at buy versus build. And by buy, I mean partnership. That's probably a, a more accurate word. So where do we build internally and where do we partnership? And we look to that complementary effect where we think it makes a lot of sense for us financially, but also technically. Uh, and there's, at the end of the day, it's got to be driven by the customer benefits. So, what, and, and of course, that goes to four things when we look at that in that framework. First of all, the strategic element. Are the companies that we partner with, are they strategically aligned with where we want to go? We're not asking them to do unnatural things. There's a strategic alignment between us and them, so that's good. The second thing, of course, is the economics need to work. So it's got to be economical for us to, to partnership. The third thing is the operational part of that. Are they capable? Do they have good quality? Can they scale? Are they global? And that's the, the, the third part of that quadrant. And then the last part, and it's, it's the part that's the most important, but it's the part that's quite often underplayed, and that is trust. Mm. Do we trust that, they, that those partners are aligned with our values, or, they, or do we trust that they will deliver the quality that they promised? Or do we trust that they will deliver the, 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 the volumes that they promised? And when we align those four things into an area we think we would be best to outsource that, that's when we partner. And so that's the framework by which we use. What do we want to build and bring internally because we see it as a core competence? This is the stuff that we're going to partner. Here are the four elements to that partnership framework. When that works, we go. And then we can go big and we can go quickly because everything's fully aligned at that point in time. I like this idea of trust, which is also the theme of the World Economic <laughs> Forum yeah. this year. It's another dimension of the trust that is necessary, which is the trust in the partnerships that make industries uh, work. And right? when you, you look at it simply, of course, that makes sense. <clears throat> but it's often underplayed, and people get wrapped up, quite frankly, on the economics. Who's the cheapest? Yeah. I mean, honestly, that's, that's a shame on us, but that often is the case. And mm. it was good to hear your point. You say, we deal now with the CEOs, we mm. don't deal with the procurement team. Mm. And that helps make sure that we make the longer term mm. decisions, which are much more strategically orientated than mm. tactically orientated. Um, but, but you need to work at that mm. because that's not been the framework until for a lot of companies, let's just say. So, Hilde, how would you do this uh, in, uh, how do you do this, actually, in Hydro, this idea that uh, what are the, the principles or the values that you would look for in a partnership? Yeah, I, I think that we, we uh, what we're looking for here is a systemic shift. Uh, because if you are just part of a value chain and, and, um, and, and we can allocate uh, all this capital to... Uh, to, to chase the, the CO2, to 
uh, to, 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 to allocate capital for tests, for pilot plants, uh, to demonstrate the technologies. And we, we, we are, we're doing all this, but there's, there's not a pool in the market. So, uh, so, so that is what excites me on, on, the, on, on what we experience now in the first mover coalition, because we have to develop a, a demand for, uh, and, and we have to, to match the, 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 the most advanced, uh, that, that's always where it start, the most advanced that set, a, set their, themselves a target, and they're looking for partners. For example, in, in, uh, in, in terms of working to get to zero, we see that, for example, in recycled in, in the recycled content, we we uh, we we put together our technologists from us and from it could be Mercedes, it could be Porsche, it could be the, our partners, and then they're looking into if we if we increase the recycled content, for example, what what would would that what what would uh, the influence be on the specification? Mm -hmm. Because in the past, specification, that was the Bible. There were no way that the procurement guys could yeah. change the, the, the specification. <coughs> but now they're looking for not only the, 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 the lowest price, but they're looking to see how could they, they reduce the embedded carbon footprint of the car. And, uh, and then if we use more higher recycle content, then perhaps you could, could, uh, uh, could um, change the specification a little bit. And then you get things going, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, and that is a kind of a partnership where you you use your competences. Uh, another another very important uh, area that we are working on is uh, is eco design or design, uh, because in order to increase the recycling content, uh, we we work with um, with the designers of the facades or in the building or uh, the next design of a car, and if that car could also be designed so that it's easily recyclable when, when the, the, life, the end of life for the car. Because we want to have the, 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 the material back, back after use. And if it's uh, welded or if it's uh, put together so that it's hard to sort and shred, that makes the, the, that then you reduce the value of the, uh, of the, um, of the, of the, of the aluminum that has been in use. So that is also a way to to to, um, to partner to see how we can get that car back back after use. So it's this back and forth between yeah. uh, the, uh, the the two parties or the multiple parties uh, to adjust each other. Robin, what's partnerships for you? Okay, I think uh, the whole thing is, uh, for example, up to design for the cycle. Mm. Usually, when you think about the whole designs, you know, think of design for repairman. Design for recycle, design to safety, design to cost, design to sustainability, all this kind of thing. I think every every time I focus on really suppliers, innovation capability, mm -hmm. they bring us some of the very critical materials. They fund it. For example, they have a new additive. For example, they have new castle materials, which what together different elements put into together as an electrical chemical system. Then we have a chemical system innovation to improve the energy density, improve the safety, reduce the cost, all these kind of things. Number two is uh, about the delivery, same as what Jim said. So number three, sewer is uh, sustainability and the CO2 because we already have four factory. It's a zero carbon uh, factory already in the world. And we commit by year 2025 all key battery manufacturing, our factory, all zero. Mm. 2035, all the supply chain, so it's very tough. That's why when we're selecting, we're always asking suppliers, where you allocate? Mm -hmm. Do you have green energy? Mm -hmm. So like, a, like, a, like a state government said, Georgia, uh, they can provide the green energy, let everyone be more happy. Mm -hmm. Because these guys, Counting every CO2, mm -hmm. and then we have a, <laughs> we have a battery battery passport mm -hmm. to trace every each battery kilowatt hour, how many how many uh, CO2 consume mm -hmm. when you make this battery. Mm -hmm. So digitalize, you cannot hide, you cannot whenever people say, oh, this passport, mm, this guy the battery is uh, one kilowatt hour battery, you have 80 kilogram of the CO2 emission. 
It's a big shame, right? Or oh, what standard? Maybe 40. Now, how can I sell the battery to these guys, right? And the consumer with a barcode, hmm, Robin, <laughs> you are <a> dirty battery. <laughs> That's really, you know, big trouble for us. That's why I'm looking for sustainability is all off this very critical. Mm. Thank you, Robin, for bringing in also this idea of uh, the integrity right. uh, of the exercise. That it's not just uh, saying that you're going to do it, but tracing it uh, right. to make sure that it happens. Governor, what does partnerships uh, look like from where you sit? Well, I think in talking to the companies that we're recruiting, people that are looking to the state, I mean, they obviously uh, want to produce with clean energy. Right. Uh, we're thankfully a state that's doing a lot of that despite not having a, you know, a lot of wind in our state. We're not a, a wind production state, but we are, I think, the 10th largest state in the country for solar. Mm. Now we have solar production facilities in the state. And then we just uh, completed uh, one of our two new nuclear reactors. Mm. So from a clean energy perspective and you know, people looking to produce, uh, especially heavy manufacturing with large loads, data centers, or, you know, for AI and everything that's going on in, in that world right now. Um, we've done as much as anybody in the country, first two new nuclear reactors in 30 years, um, but we're gonna have to have more. And I think most other states, especially in the South, where mm. GDP is outpaced in the Northeast now because of OEMs coming uh, to our states. Uh, we're going to have to continue to do that. That's what these companies want. They want uh, green, clean energy. And so we're focused uh, on working with partnerships with our power companies and uh, especially Georgia Power and the Southern Company to be able to do that. And it, it's a great marketing tool for our state from an economic development standpoint. Thank you. Um, floor to the audience now for questions. Um, please uh, raise your hand and tell us who you are briefly and put the, your question to the panel. Let me start with the gentleman over there and then we'll take this lady. Uh, hello, it's Charlie Nunn. I'm the CEO of Lloyd's Banking Group in the UK and I'm the biggest owner of EVs in the UK, for, for which is why I'm here. Um, first of all, thank you. It's been brilliant to hear this perspective. Can I, can I ask a bit more about innovation in battery and maybe... <laughs> Ravi, you talked about sodium, which is great. Um, we have to take a view because 90% plus of vehicles require financing around the, the next generation of technology and what it's going to do to residual values. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of discussion around solid state technology and then the next, as you said, types of batteries which will be lower cost. So that's one question. And then secondly, and maybe a Jim, this leasing battery model that's emerged in China that I've seen What's the thought process? Because if for you and then for, for the economies that would have to embrace that, it's a radically different model. Is there any thought process for you, for example, as an OEM, thinking that might be a model that has traction um, in the West? Thank you. Uh, Robin. So let me answer the first questions about the innovation of technology in battery field. Uh, actually, there's uh, two uh, areas. Some areas people try to increase the energy density more and more. Today, let me give you an example about the current uh, technology in the NCM. The pack, the whole pack, uh, not, not only cell, the whole pack. Usually we can up to 260 watt per kilogram in a pack. So <clears throat> if you have a car, 1,000 kilometers range, so you almost require the, like 140, 140 kilowatt hour battery pack. So this is one. But if we can increase the battery, we cannot say double. If we double, it's almost easier to assess. So today we have some technology up to double, no, not double, 70%, 80% increase our energy density. We call it a condensed matter battery by CATL. But now it's very, very expensive. So we are focused on the aviation applications. For the car, it's later on when the production how to say the scale up, we can reduce lead. And the solid state battery now is uh, people focusing a lot on lead. They usually is in the cell level, the highest uh, estimation is around uh, 600 watt per kilogram in cell, uh, cell level. So when you go into pack, uh, probably you can get the, the better, the best, probably 400 watt per kilogram. So <coughs> there's still a lot, long way to go. 
because uh, to be the mass production, to be cost effective, to be the safety, to be whatever. That's one thing. Another direction is people talking about uh, long cycle life batteries. So usually your car, char one charge 500 kilometers, then you have 1,000 charge cycle, you have enough because almost half a million. Mm -hmm. Then for the consumer, it's not for Uber, for taxi, you maybe need 1 million, right? But it's 500,000 uh, 500, kilometer for accumulate, it's good enough. But uh, now, new business model may come, we call a vehicle to grid. Mm -hmm. It means uh, when you park your cars in the garage, in the nighttime, you charge the battery, and also grid can use your car as a battery energy storage. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you only drive your car, and the car will make money for you. Then it required every day, every cycle, or two cycles, several cycles. It means the cycle life can be enlarged. For example, we have technology to make a cycle life 18,000, 18,000 cycles. Mm -hmm. So if you own the battery, own the car, you just put into your garage, then probably make your, a lot of money so for the charging. So these two directions drive the technology uh, innovations. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Yeah, just to come back on the, the, the question in terms of uh, uh, battery leasing. Um, let me back up a little bit. So if you look at how cars have been manufactured in the past, uh, it was very different from, and we tend to use electrification as a proxy for a brand new technology and how we, how we produce cars. So in the past, you would have distributed through the vehicle somewhere like 140, 150 ECUs or EMUs, so small boxes of basic electronics that control certain parts of the car. Okay, when you move to a core computer architecture, as we have done, and of course electric as well, it gives you a huge amount of benefits that, that don't quite uh, bubble to the surface unless you pull them to the surface. Okay, so, so, so I'm really pleased you asked the question. We tend to talk about electrification as this proxy. Quite frankly, electrification is the tip of the iceberg. The much, much more profound change that's going on in the industry right now is software, silicon, yeah. connectivity, and data. Robin and like-minded people like Robin will continue to increase energy density, they will continue to reduce cost, they will continue to make batteries safer, and we will continue to make progress in that. But we understand that technology and we know how to, hands, to harness that. We understand the, the chemistry within that and we understand e-motors, inverters, and the battery management system that extracts the value from that. Let's call that the electrical propulsion system. So I'm gonna move that to one side and say, we have a pretty good deal on that right now. And, and we're moving fast. Great. <laughs> now we get to core compute. That's the, this is the tougher stuff. This is where we as, 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 as automotive companies really need to invest much, much deeper. And that's what we've done at Volvo for the simple reason. I'm getting to your point on, on battery leasing. When you go to core compute architecture, I know everything that's happening in that car. And our next model, when that first car rolls off the production line, a digital twin is born in the Volvo cloud. Okay, we're not doing this yet. This will happen in our next, our next, uh, our next production cycle. When that, that digital twin is born in the cloud, I see everything. I know where that car has been. I know when it's been driven. I know if it's been overcharged or undercharged on the, on the battery side. I know if it's been repaired, if it's been repaired using our blockchain technology with, with genuine Volvo parts. That means that when you come to sell that car, which is really your question in terms of residual value, when you come to sell that car, I can sit down and say, hey, you're going to buy this car, okay, let's have a look. I'll look at the digital twin, which we would share with our dealership network, and they can see everything that that car has done. The amount of miles it's done, when it's been serviced, when it's not been serviced. We, through our software algorithms, can determine how good that battery still is. We call it battery passport. And the battery passport then allows us to say, you want to buy that, we Volvo will guarantee that battery for another 10 years. So for us, I want to keep the battery attached. Because if the battery's attached to a Volvo car, I know everything that's done. When you start leasing off batteries, and that may work for some companies, I don't see it working for us, quite frankly, but I see it maybe working for other companies. But for us, I want the integrity of the vehicle to include the battery, because it's the electrical propulsion system. It's one of the most important ingredients of the car. Just one last point on something that Robin brought up. Bidirectional charging. In the new EX90, we put in bidirectional charging as standard. So we can, we can do V2V, vehicle to vehicle, V2H, vehicle to home, and V2G, vehicle to grid. You think about it, by 2030, Volvo on its own will have somewhere in the region of 200 
gigawatts of power on the road. Mm. Most of it comes home at night. Mm. Cars generally are used 85% of the time, or sorry, are unused 85% of the time. <laughs> that is a latency yeah. of energy, quite frankly, that we need to connect into the grid if we're going to have the meaningful difference. It's wasted if we don't do that. Then you can use that during the daytime when the, when the prices are high, when everybody comes home from work between 5 and 10 in the evening, energy prices are high, the grid gets overloaded, you plug in, you use your car battery at night time, boom, you bring it down and you use the energy from the grid at an off-peak price. We need to push governments to say, if you want to do an electric car, you need to put in bi-directional energy or you don't get a license. Mm. You don't get <laughs> okay. to sell. I would make it part of the homologation, quite frankly. It's a technology that nobody owns. It's a technology that's available to everybody, and it's a technology that we should use. Secondarily, I would also ask government to say, if I do plug in my car to the grid and I make money from that, let's make it tax-free. <laughs> Governor, lots of ideas here. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then we give the tax-free money to the companies, right? <laughs> I don't think that math is going to work. <laughs> So uh, my name is Li Xia from China. I'm the Social uh, Innovator Awardee of 2024 by SWA Foundation, uh, WEF. So my question is to Jim and uh, Robin. Uh, now we were discussing a lot about the batteries uh, decarbonization by upstream and downstream. Uh, since I'm working for the people who is still 800 million people in the darkness without any electricity, electricity supply, have you ever think of, instead of recycle your batteries, but reuse, refurb re refur refurbish the, the batteries and to empower the people who is still in the development countries, underdeveloped or underprivileged situations, power them by a lower uh, cost of access of energy by solar or by the storage of the battery. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Robin's a PhD, so I'm going to let him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a very good question on that. Reuse the battery, probably today is, uh, we have some uh, difficulty on that. When you're selling the car to the people, then the people own the whole car, according to law, right? They own the, not only the car body, uh, also on the battery. So we have to ask them, please come give, give the battery to me for refurbish uh, to reuse or to recycle. Usually, consumer also very smart. They say, oh, today lithium is uh, 30, you know, it's a very high dollar, then he calculate how many lithium can be extracted from the battery. Then he talked to me, he said, Robin, hmm, this battery worth of 10,000 RMB, or 1,000 US dollars. Then tomorrow, when the lithium goes up, they say, no, 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 I need to increase the, the selling price to 1,200. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so such kind of things is, for us as a technology company, the only problem is not how we can refurbish that is easier. How we can get the battery to my factory uh -huh. to do the refurbish. As a matter of fact, uh, the last year we do the recycle is 100,000 tons waste battery in China, and then we make 13,000 tons of lithium carbonate reuse in the battery. Mm -hmm. So economically, this is good. But how can we get the government support to direct to say, oh, this part of the battery, please, you do the refurbish by the technology company, then send this to the underdevelopment peoples to help them to make electricity. This is rely on the government side. Oh. So we have just time for a I'll very... Just Sorry, I'll just, Sorry. Just really quickly on the, <laughs> on the energy piece. So LFP technology, which is a great technology, especially if you're going to use the battery for storage. Right. Right. So, and more and more we're starting to see LFP uh, come into mainstream car manufacture, which is, which is great. But whether you use new batteries or whether you use recycled batteries, um, I think one of the big opportunities that we have as, as car manufacturers, we have access to large-scale battery production, and we can get that at reasonable cost. Yeah. Recently, at, at Volvo Cars, we just set up a new business called Volvo, uh, Volvo Energy Solutions. And the purpose of that company is to take the knowledge, is to take the supply chain, is to take the cost of benefits that we get through buying hundreds of millions of batteries and bring that to, to static storage. So we now have products whereby you can buy 250 gigawatts, 500, 750, or one gig. And that's, think of that, it looks like a shipping container. And it's then got static storage. So rather than, rather than running 
on a diesel generator, it allows you to do this the same. So, so places in the world that have access to, let's say, solar, but they don't, they don't then know how, have the access to store that solar, that's a fantastic opportunity for some of the developing nations around the world to actually harness the natural resources that they've got in solar and then have somewhere that can store that. You know, it's great for schools, it's great for backups for hospitals and, and, and that stuff. So we're, we're bullish about being able to take an adjacent business model, if you like, using the core technologies that we've developed over a number of years with a number of different partners. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of this uh, very, very rich and interesting session. I uh, see a, bit, a few hands. Uh, I think you can uh, approach uh, the panelists uh, offline now. Uh, let me tell you that uh, the results of this conversation, which has shown the many different angles uh, that this discussion uh, brings to the table will inform the work of the World Economics Forum Center for Advanced Manufacturing and uh, Supply Chain uh, within the scope of the uh, Industry Net Zero Accelerator Initiative. So I guess please contribute to this initiative and watch this space which has an incredible promise. Thank you and a big applause to our panelists. <laughs>